Let's look at the second context of globalization, the economic context. So, okay, many people say, okay, so we started off uh, unevenly, but now, uh, now let's make it better and, and let's make this world more equal. And for example, doesn't free trade now equalize the world? So now let's open it up. Let's see, okay, we can all trade with each other. Free trade should help us. And there's a lot of very good thought and very good reasoning in, in this claim. Free trade is extremely powerful. Uh, the idea goes back to one of the founding fathers of economics, Davis Ricardo. And let me tell you a little bit how, about the power of free trade. So Ricardo's logic can be explained this way. Uh, think about Rookie, who builds clocks and blankets. And Rookie needs four hours to build a clock and three hours to make a blanket. So in total, there's seven hours of time Rookie needs to make a clock and a blanket. And now imagine there's somebody else, maybe from another country, who is Richie. And Richie, she only needs one hour to make a clock and two hours to make a blanket. So she's much more productive in total, she only needs three hours. What would be the logic? What do you think if you think about economic competition? What will happen if we let these two lose? Now you might think that, you know, economic selection, Richie will survive and Rookie is going out of business, but look at it this way. What if Rookie would specialize on blankets? So Rookie makes two blankets, would need six hours for doing that. And Richie only makes clocks and she needs two hours to make two clocks. And now they trade. So at the end, Rookie has a clock and a blanket and only did six hours of work, not the previous seven hours. So Rookie reduced his time and Richie as well at the end has a clock and a blanket, but only need also need two hours of work. So she also increased her productivity. So it is smart for them to stay as they are, specialize and then trade. Everybody can be better off with trade. And that's the powerful idea behind trade. And that's the argument that many people make to, you know, to have free trade worldwide, because according to this logic, also developing countries can benefit from trade. Now, if you look at the newspapers and what's happening with regard to the discussion of globalization, um, many people say that free trade is actually the devil. The World Trade Organization, WTO, is really evil. It hurts developing countries to have free trade. So, so what, what happens here? What, what's going on? Isn't free trade a good thing? Or isn't it a big equalizer, a flattener in the process of globalization? Well, several things are going on. One thing that's important to consider is that certainly the Western countries took it way too far. So during the 1980s, 1990s and early 2000s, there was something that it was informally called the Washington Consensus. That is what Washington meant by policy reform. And these international organizations like the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, also the World Bank, basically pushed this agenda onto developing countries. So there were several policy instruments that you can loosely define. One of the items on the agenda was trade liberalization, driven by a logic that trade is good for everybody. The liberalization of foreign direct investment, so private companies could invest in developing countries. With that, also the pushing of the privatization of state enterprises. So developing countries were told, sell your enterprises, your transport, your telecommunication enterprises, uh, because the private sector can take care of it much better, especially the private sector from developed countries that went into, into developing countries. So what, what were the problems with pushing that uh, too far? Well, first of all, uh, often the Western world was measuring with two sticks when they applied this kind of policy agenda. Think about it this way. So last time I was at the UC coffee house down in UCLA, uh, I saw that you can buy a medium regular coffee for $1.85 and a medium fair trade coffee for $2.25. So there's a 20% difference in price. Did you ever think about what might be the reason that poor people in developing countries sell their coffee for 20% under what is considered to be the fair price? What is very unlikely is that they just have too much money 
and that's why they give up 20% of their salary. I mean, would you? Would you just give up 20% of your salary just because? No, that is that is extremely unlikely. So uh, without going into the details, there's most probably some kind of coercion going on. So kind of like we force them to sell us the coffee 20% cheaper. Now it's not a coercion with a gunpoint on your head. It's a more subtle, maybe economic coercion with different negotiations in place and so forth, different institutional mechanisms in place. But the result is that they are kind of like forced to sell their coffee in this case for 20% under price. Um, so we here, on the other hand, we subsidize our agriculture. We give our agriculture money in order to get a competitive advantage in, in developed countries in Europe and in, in the United States. So we are measuring with two sticks there. We force them on the other hand to reduce and on the other hand, we give money to our farmers. So, uh, the, uh, another example of where we measure with two sticks is, for example, with regard to this privatization, with the liberalization of, of foreign direct investments forcing governments to sell their property, for example, mines and, and other things, with the result that the government in developed countries is usually twice as big with regard to the share the government has in the economy than governments in lower and middle income countries. So in high income countries, the government share of the economy is almost 30% and in lower middle income countries, it's, it's a little bit over 15%. So it's twice as big. Um, so we also measure with two six. We tell them sell everything you have, but we don't really do it. And that's also because we know that privatization can be very constructive. We had results in increased competition. For example, privatization of telecommunication has been very effective in in, in most cases, in the vast majority. But under certain cer certain circumstances, for example, in public transport, in the case of water supply. Public ownership might be preferable to private enterprises, but this view is not typical of Washington during these years of the Washington consensus. And there are these famous stories where, for example, the Bolivian government at one point privatized the national water supply and a private company was now in charge of the national water supply and people didn't have water to drink. And the private company basically said, well, you buy this price of a, for a bottle of water, or I will just like export it and sell it in another country. I bring it to some kind of stock market. I mean, this is my property now. And people said, well, what are you, these are dwells, these are rivers, these are, and you, but we need to drink. So they were pushed very, very far, uh, developing countries during that time. And we certainly in developed countries, in Western countries, we did not go as far. We were measuring with two sticks there. A second argument is that trade liberalization, free trade, is not always good. Following Ricardo's logic, it, it can be extremely good, but um, the free trade idea is generally conceded to subject to qualifications. For example, the first concerns infant industries, which may merit substantial but strictly temporary protections. That's what economists tell us. That means free trade is not very useful if you try to create new industries, infant industries that might merit some protection during the first years while they're still in the process of growing. Let's look at that. So for example, imagine you are a developing country and you specialize in producing blankets, just like Rookie. And the other country, the developed country, specialized on producing cars. Now, what you can do all history long is you produce blankets and the other one produces cars. And according to Ricardo, trade among you two assures a win-win, can assure a win-win between the both of you. But at the end, you might think, well, producing car high tech, you know, there's much more innovation, that's much more added value. And eventually you might also want to industrialize and create a car industry in your developing country. So how would you go about that? Well, you would create a car company and set it up and create the first generation of cars that you made in, in your country. Now, you can be assured that these cars will be pretty bad and quite expensive because you have no experience in creating cars. There's no know-how, there's no history, there's no, so they will not be good quality and way too expensive. So traditional car companies, I don't know, Ford, Volkswagen, Toyota, they will just 
blow you out of out of the sea. I mean, you, there's no way you can compete with them just starting off as, as a rookie in this. So what's the solution to that? Well, one solution is known as import substitution industrialization. The idea there would be that, okay, you have an infant industry, an industry that you want to grow like a baby. And what you do is you artificially protect this industry through import trade barriers. So let's say your car is much more expensive, you artificially add a tariff on other cars that are imported, cars from other countries, and make them at least as expensive, if not even more expensive, because your car is also worse quality. So your car artificially becomes competitive. Why would you want to do that? That's, that's not very great for, for the consumers. Well, but it's great for you, for your car company industry, because now you get some money back and with this money you can build a second generation of cars. And you can sell them then again, you build, you build a third generation of cars and they always become better. You will learn, uh, you will sell a lot of cars, they become cheaper and better. And at one point, you reach a quality where you're actually competitive with the global standard. And at that point, you completely eliminate the trade barrier. And it's not an infant industry anymore, it's a real competitive industry. And you say, okay, let's go, Let, let's compete. It's kind of like you can think about it like gladiators, right? So you cannot send a baby gladiator into the ring with, with an adult trained gladiator, that will be a blood fest. It, it doesn't really work. What a crazy idea. You have to train it first and once it's competitive, then you say, okay, now let's, let's come on, let's fight. So that's the idea of the input substitution industrialization. You substitute for the products until you're competitive enough through these trade barriers. And if you look at the historical record, most of the what we nowadays call developed economies, including France, Germany, Japan, uh, Sweden, Switzerland, UK and USA, they all used this strategy back in the 1800s and 1900s. So they had very high barriers, trade barriers. And now the argument is once we reach the modern times, they kind of like they were kicking away the ladder. Kind of like saying, okay, now, now we have great industries now. Well, but actually now, you remember that thing with the free trade from Ricardo, like from 1700s? Wasn't that a great idea? So why don't we fight like men, like gladiators now in the ring? Let's come on and fight. Well, it, it's kind of like more like kicking away the ladder. So they all used this kind of, of theory to develop and create their own industries. So trade liberalization is not always useful and has not always been used. Uh, but this modern wave of trade liberalization forced industrial countries to completely go for it. It's now, it's now very difficult to really create an industry a modern industry in a developing countries. There are new approaches to a joint venture and so forth, but they also have to do with very profound interventions um, that have to guide it. Free trade will not lead to the creation of industries in developing countries. And this kind of agenda, the Western world has pushed for a long time, also in other markets, for example, in capital markets, to say it with the words of the Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stieglitz. He wrote this very nice book at one point called Globalization and its Discontents. He says, well, small countries or developing countries in general are like small boats. Liberalizing their markets is like setting them loose on a rough sea. Even if the boats are well captained, even if the boats are sound, they are likely to be hit board side by a big wave and capsize. But the International Monetary Fund, IMF and other institutions push the boats to set forth into the roughest parts of the sea before they were seaworthy with untrained captains and crews and without life vests. No wonder matters turned out so badly. And now you can see of some of the arguments why actually also there's a big inequality in economic development. That has nothing to do with a very long-term historical background of colonization. It's a very, a very recent time, the 90s and the early 2000s, where we pushed for these kind of agendas that unflattened the world, that made globalization even more unequal in economic terms.